record this uh, session because there are a lot of faculty in different schools who can't necessarily join us. And, and so I'm recording now. And uh, once, uh, once we finish up, I'll process the recording. I'll get it uploaded to the TLTC YouTube channel and so that it can be shared out with, uh, it, with you, all of you if you want to go back and look at something again or um, uh, share it out to your colleagues who aren't here. If you want to follow along at home, these Google Docs slides are available at this bit.ly link. And um, I'm not monitoring the chat anymore, Marie, so if you want to copy that link into the chat so that people can click on it. Uh, these, my slides, I've, I've applied a Creative Commons uh, CC BY license to them, so if you want to retain, reuse, remix, revise, redistribute any of this material, it's all Creative Commons licensed. Um, so go ahead and share uh, as, as much as you want. I want to talk a little bit before we get into the nuts and bolts of Zoom about uh, some issues we all need to think about about how we can support our students for the rest of the semester with what I'm calling remote instruction. What all of us are doing this week and probably going forward, I hesitate to call it online learning because online learning really would be involve a whole intentional course redesign process where we start with this backwards course design. What are the learning outcomes? What are the the learning activities and assessments that are needed to do that uh, and so forth. So really if we just think about we've got our classes, they are not online classes or maybe some of them are, if, if so you're probably all set, but we most of us have face-to-face -face classes, we've got this situation, we need to support our students to complete the credits they need for this semester by various remote instruction approaches. So um, let, me, let me just talk, a, set the framework by talking a little bit about our face-to-face -face instruction, okay? We have classrooms, we've got students coming at a assigned time, we're showing up, we're doing things, we're presenting material, we're having, group, or having class discussions, small group discussions, maybe we're doing in-class writing assignments, quizzes, student presentations, all of this stuff that happens in our face-to-face -face classes. We've got making going on on campus. We've got performances. We've got lab activities. We've got all of these instructional activities that are part of the experience that our students need to complete their curriculum. And this space-time bundling thing at the bottom is not some weird physics thing. By nature, because we are all joining together in the classroom at a given time, all of these activities tend to be bundled when we do our face-to-face -face classes. Yeah? So, um, faculty who teach primarily online, uh, face to face when, when they have to deal with what um, we would consider remote instruction, the first thing is, well, how do I take that, that space-time bundle of activities that I do in my face-to-face -face classroom, and how do, I how do I replicate, how do I redo that online? And that's why, you know, the campus has invested so much in Zoom. That's the primary reason for, you know, the session that Aviva uh, asked me to do today um, to, you know, talk about some of these ideas of using Zoom. But I want us all to be very intentional about what, how we're approaching our classes. This model of, I've got my bundle of things I do uh, in my face-to-face -face class, I'm going to take it online, has pros and cons, especially if you're focused on using Zoom for that. Uh, Zoom is a kind of a natural analog because you've got a classroom, it's just, it's online instead of in the NatSci building. Students are coming at a given time, you're coming at a given time, and, and then you have to figure out how do you do the activities that you would do in the classroom, or at least some set of, class, of activities. I just want to say, uh, I don't want to be, um, you know, scary about this, but 
synchronous online activities raises the technical bar above a lot of other instructional tools that we could do to provide remote instruction for our students. Your technology has to work at the time you have to go to the class. All the students have to be there. You know, it's, it's everybody's there at the same time. The technology all has to work. And, and by and large, it does, but we don't really know necessarily what technology situations our students are going to be in. I just want to take a few minutes before we get into the nuts and bolts of Zoom to, talk, to say that there are lots of asynchronous remote online learning activities that you can set up for your students that will meet the instructional needs of your course, oftentimes just as well, or in fact, maybe even better. Um, and the more that you can think about unbundling what you do in the classroom and figure out, well, what do I really need to do to accomplish this? The better you will be. Because class time, meeting as a class, is not the learning outcome for our classes, right? The learning outcome is so that students engage with such and such material. They are able to apply these concepts. They are able to perform these particular aspects. We sh shouldn't necessarily just figure out that well, I normally meet Monday, Thursday at 2.30 with my class in face to face. Therefore, the only appropriate instructional uh, model is to do that same thing online. Um, so uh, Marie and I have worked to put together this teaching during campus closure guide. It's been sent out uh, a few different times. Uh, we continue to add to it. I just want to emphasize there are more tools in your toolkit than just setting up a Zoom room and trying to do the class the way you would normally do it. If you focus on what the students need to do, I need to present material to them. They need to discuss. Uh, I need to have some way of having students present their work. I need to have some way of having to each other, to the class. I need to have some way of having the students uh, uh, submit their work product to me. All of that can certainly be done within Zoom, but it's at a much higher stakes level if you're trying to do it all synchronously. Uh, so I won't take a lot of time, but I do, do want to just highlight a couple of tools. And again, go, go to our, our document, our guide there, and, and see, try to map what you need your students to accomplish. Because the goal is not trying to replicate your classes in an in a artificial environment. The goal is to help your students do the things they need to, need to do to complete their credits. Um, we had a very great workshop. I sound like our, our tweeter in chief. Sorry, we had, a, we had a very nice workshop uh, Monday uh, with a, a bunch of faculty on how to use the voice thread activity in Moodle to present material to your students. Uh, voice thread is a woefully underused tool that's, you know, that's built right into our Moodle system. If you spend any of your time Presenting material to your students from a PowerPoint or a Google Docs slideshow or Keynote or whatever, yeah, you could do that in Zoom, but you could probably do it just as effectively, if not more effectively, through a voice thread that will allow you to take your slides of information, put them up into an, um, a, an, an, an online native format that lives in your course Moodle page. You can narrate those slides right within the activity. I mean, we could all take our PowerPoints, dump them up in our Moodle course and say, okay, we've given our students the instructional materials, but what student's gonna get much out of just going through your PowerPoint slides? It's you talking about them. It's you, you, you pointing out things, drawing things. So VoiceThread is a way that you can do that. It is asynchronous, so you can provide that presentation of material to your students in a format where they can get it at any point in the week when they have time to go into the Moodle course. If they, you know, they, you don't have to have them all together in a Zoom. And so the, the workshop, we, we've got that re recording of that up on our YouTube channel. Uh, just yesterday, we did a workshop on using a couple of um, 
activities from the H5P activity in Moodle, you can put together course presentations that not only present the material, but allow you to embed actual quizzes and, and other uh, items in, in, uh, in the, into the uh, course, into the presentation. Many of us um, present videos, uh, web videos to our students as part of the material that they are trying to go through. Now you could start a Zoom session, you could open up the YouTube page, you could try to push, pump that, that YouTube video through the uh, Zoom session and, and I'll show you how to do that. But there is an activity in Moodle where you can take that YouTube video and put it in a wrapper where you can actually, at time four minutes and 27 seconds, I want the video to stop and I want the students to answer a question. And that's a you know, much better way of trying to keep the students engaged. Uh, class discussions, obviously Moodle has a discussion forum activity, the voice thread activity, you can set up uh, uh, a conversation, uh, a set of slides where students are using their their microphone or their webcam to to have a conversation about the materials. And clearly in Zoom there are a number of options that we'll get to when we get to the Zoom part of today where um, you know those of you who are chatting away in in the chat you can see how that chat feature of Zoom can play a role in supporting ongoing discussions. You certainly could have a whole class discussion in Zoom where you set up the Zoom session, you have everyone turn their webcam on, everyone turn their microphone on, and you try to have a conversation. There are specific you know, aspects to that. It, it's gonna be different than having a face-to-face -face conversation discussion in your classroom. You're gonna to have to figure out how are you gonna queue up who's gonna be talking next. I mean, we just did the College Senate meeting over Zoom, and that was a bit of an issue. How do we know who, who's next in line to say something? In the classroom, you've got all sorts of nonverbal cues to help direct the conversation. If you want to do that through a, a whole class discussion in Zoom, you're going to have to figure out how to monitor and queue up, well, who's the next person to talk and so forth. Zoom does have breakout rooms, so you can do small group discussions in Zoom. Um, not, I mean, you clearly don't have much time today, so I'm not gonna go in that a lot amount of depth about Zoom today, but I'm doing a workshop tomorrow on Zoom where we'll, where we'll cover some of that. Um, student presentations, again, you could have your students create voice threads where they're putting their slides together and talking about them and sharing them with the class. You can have students post videos to YouTube that can then easily be shared in your, in your Moodle class. And that's another way for your students to present performances, pre present presentations, uh, present the, you know, the work of their uh, design classes uh, in a way that um, is easily shared. For that, I, I guess I would recommend the forum activity in Moodle. If you set up a discussion forum, we're going to uh, where you have uh, all of your students post their YouTube materials. Moodle will embed it, and you can have have the conversation. You probably want to encourage your students go ahead and post your stuff to YouTube, but post it as unlisted. No one's going to find it if it's up as an unlisted uh, item, but it can still be shared into Moodle. And of course you know, the, the, the focus of today is, is using Zoom. Uh, if you set up a Zoom session, you can have the students share their desktop to do presentations just like I'm doing, doing now. Um, so, I mean, these are just a few things. Um, I, we're all scrambling, so none of us has a time to do a full, let's redesign the course to teach online. But uh, if you think a little bit about unbundling your class activities and looking at other items other than in addition to Zoom, you probably have a, a better suite of experiences to help your students do what they need to do before the end of the semester. And 
Uh, I mean, you don't have to worry. I mean, if, if your focus is, is on how do I help the students meet the learning outcomes for the course, and you've got learning activities where your students are watching a voice thread, they're coming into Zoom, maybe one of the two tech class times for the, for the class, they're doing other things online. As long as those activities contribute to your students fulfilling what they need to do to earn credit for the course, you're golden as far as Carnegie, you know, course credits and all of that stuff is concerned. You don't have to worry about, I'm losing this amount of seat time face-to-face, -face, therefore I have to have the same amount of seat time online. As long as you've got learning activities that, that meet these outcomes, then, then you should be set whether or not you're meeting the whole, you know, 100 minutes of class time a given day that your face-to-face -face class is. So at this point, Marie, I think I'll take, uh, I'll take a break here. Were there any questions from the chat that uh, that I should address I think I have a question yeah go ahead okay so a room full of filmmakers here yes work with, uh, at this point the students in many classes are showing their films and getting like collective feedback from the yep. room. so it's a way to minimize the the loss right so, so again, your your filmmakers are they working individually or in groups? Well, they they shoot their films, you know, individually, but the but the, the feedback is collected. right. So you you want to how to how to do the peer review? So if your if your filmmakers are shooting their individual films, there they've got their film produced, and they can put it up in YouTube as an unlisted or public if they want, for that matter, video. You could set up a discussion forum where each student posts a link to their YouTube or their Vimeo page where their project is. Moodle will take that and embed it right in their discussion forum post. And then all of the colleagues, all of their peers in the class can easily just watch the films that the student has posted. They can use the uh, forum posting replies to be able to provide peer feedback on the film. Um, so there's there's lots of um, of options there. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No? So Bill, did I see a notice that you were raising your hand? Your your audio is not coming okay. through. Barely. They just posted to uh, the chat that uh, Governor Cuomo just announced the closing. Uh, maybe Kay wants to comment on that. We're officially closed. SUNY? I just saw a tweet. It is on Facebook, however, so I'm trying to get the relevant. Okay. Um, but it's but it says, it, so he uh, mentioned Purchase College specifically. Yeah, so um, we. You know, I haven't seen it, so I, the, here would be my questions. What does closure mean? It's not does written it, as closure. It's right. moving to online. Yeah, That's okay. That's what it is. It's not closure. Yeah. So everyone, everyone wants to avoid the term we're closing classes because right. as soon as that happens, students lose their financial aid. They've got to pay a lot of money, or we, or we or they have to pay a lot of money back to the federal government. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, we do we no one wants to say closure so yeah that uh, was one of the biggest concerns i know there was an email sent out yesterday saying administration had to spend all that time um but i just wanted to i think all of us have also encountered the same thing where students were coming to professors for reassurance because they, yeah. they were having trouble you know understanding what the emails were actually saying yeah so um, it might be helpful if the administration clearly sent out an email saying closure is not what's going to happen, right? Right. If that's the case, and that yeah. will not be kicked off. I mean, I, I can certainly pass that on to those who are in charge of the messaging, but uh, I'm you. sure I'm that sorry, your... no, but but it, it, given, I mean, if this announcement has come out from the governor's office, all of us should expect a whole lot of communication coming out. Well, I would hope. Uh, from from the administration. So, I mean, this will make not only 
Zoom, but all of those other asynchronous online remote instruction tools that I just talked about, even more important. And I'll be honest with you, there are, we have a lot of courses here at Purchase where there are no online remote instruction tools that are going to be a panacea for this. We've got so many making classes. We've got so many performance classes. We've got, you know, the lab science classes. SUNY has, over the last several years, done a lot of investigation into um, online experiences for STEM classes that actually do fulfill learning outcomes. And so we're all going to have to be able to, to draw on those. And, and doing it this late in the semester is not ideal. I mean, this is something you would want to really plan out, but, you know, to the extent that we can support, uh, we'll do that. So let me, let me, uh, Marie, unless there are other major questions in the chat. I have a follow-up question, Keith, that is important. Many of our students do not have laptops, so we want to know. Okay, laptops not, in, not, in, not required. A laptop or computers, so. Computers laptop. not required. A third of our student, uh, if you look at the Google Analytics stats on the page hits on Moodle, on our Moodle system, one third is from iOS devices, iPads, iPhones. One third is Mac OS devices. One third is Windows. Our students um, are very much mobile centric. Zoom has... Zoom has clients for for all of the mobile devices so I would expect if you're doing zoom sessions the majority of your students might actually be coming in on their phone or on their tablet um, okay, thank you yep so um, yeah, let's let's go through. Let's deep dig down into into Zoom a, a little bit then. Hey Keith, before before you go on, I've had my hand raised for a while. I don't know oh, if anybody's sorry. following the uh, hand raising function. I know that there are many windows to this thing, but yeah, a couple questions on things you've already covered. Sure. Not, not going into new material yet. That's um, fine. About uh, uh, records and recording. So one is with with the voice thread thing that you were talking about in Moodle. Um, what kind of files are those? Or do they, would the students download those and they need a separate player? No, no, no. Or it, they, do they play um, inside Moodle? They play inside Moodle. Um, VoiceThread is a native web application. You, if, um, the way most faculty would use it is, I have a set of slides that I would normally show in class at, uh, at this time on this particular day. Maybe, you, have, you know, there's 15 slides. Maybe I work in PowerPoint, maybe I work in Google Docs, whatever. Um, I'm going to create a voice thread activity in Moodle, and I'm going to upload my PowerPoint to create the content, the, the background content for that voice thread. And voice thread will take that 15 slide PowerPoint, it will convert it into 15 slides in a voice thread activity. And then on each slide, you hit the record or add comment button. You can, you can use your webcam like I've got on right now. You can just use the microphone on your computer. Uh, you could even add a text comment. But of those three, probably the most valuable is just adding audio commentary to your slides. I've, I haven't turned my, my so webcam. you have to do that individually, you said? You go to a slide and then you Yeah, you, you, could, you could create, you could add one comment that goes over all the slides, but functionally it's much better to do it slide by slide. So I've got my slide one where, I've, where I'm starting to talk about uh, gully formations on Mars for my my freshman seminar class. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe I've got a slide, slide one that just shows some of the morphologies. Uh, so it's got, you know, the, pic the, the, the pictures on and maybe some, some text bullets. I hit add comment and uh, start up my microphone. And I just start talking about what I would normally talk about in the classroom when, when that slide is up.
At the same time, I can pull up a pencil, a colored pencil, and start drawing over the slides as I'm talking. Mm -hmm. So voice threads are a very nice way to provide that kind can, of... Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll play around with that. And just yeah. related to that, um, sorry to be taking so much time. No, that's okay. Because my, my concern about... So I'm thinking primarily about a, a very a, a large class that I teach, a 100-person lecture. It's an art history yep. survey. Um, and I have worries about recording sessions and posting them in a way where people can have access to them and can share them on the one hand because of um, private right. other students in the class and things they might say or write or whatever and on the other hand my own intellectual property rights I'd rather these things like yeah. not pop up on the internet or whatever so, so, with, so with with zoom my other part of my question is can um, I see that I can record it um, right and then so then what kind of a file is that and how would they play it and second can I make it as the host of a meeting, can I make it so that other people cannot record it? I would have to look into the second question. The first question is, you know, you, you if you want, the, well, the first question is, you, you wouldn't have to record the Zoom session at all if you don't want to. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you do, it saves it as an MP4 file, okay. which is what I will be getting out of this. For this, I will pop, up, pop it up onto YouTube. For this, I will pop it up onto YouTube as a public file. If it were for class, I would probably pop it up onto my YouTube channel as an unlisted file. Mm -hmm. um, what you don't want to do is take those large MP4 files and put them up into Moodle and expect Moodle to be a dedicated video server because Moodle is a learning management system. It's not a... Um, a dedicated server. Right. Um, if you had an art history presentation with your slides though you want to talk about, you could create a voice thread of that. That voice thread lives in Moodle. You can determine uh, when you're creating the voice thread whether you're allowing other people to download the material or make copies of the voice thread. For your purposes, you probably would say no. Right. When you add the voice thread to your Moodle course, you can determine whether you want students to be able to add comments on top of your comments. The commenting feature in the voice thread can actually be threaded comments. So you can actually have the students begin to have a, a conversation or a discussion with you about the slides you're presenting. So yeah, I would go back to the, to the link to the uh, workshop recording for the, for the voice thread session. Look through that, play around with, with VoiceThread. I think it's got some uh, yeah, yeah. opportunities. That sounds, that sounds like good. I'll, I'll do that. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, the, the raised hand notices pop up and then go away. Stephen? Okay. Um, so just about the licenses, uh, I've had many faculty come to me saying, as Adam did earlier, well, I've already got my free version of Zoom, but it's got this 40-minute limitation. How can I work with that? You can if you really want to, like if Adam really doesn't want to re redo all of the sessions. Uh, I've taken, uh, I've got, in addition to my pro account for the TLTC, I've got a personal account for me, which has the 40-minute limitation. And given that we are officially mentioned in a governor, governor press release, we might be able to get Zoom to uh, remove that 40-minute limitation on our personal accounts, but we'll have to see about that. You could schedule back-to-back 30-minute -back sessions, have a link to the next session uh, in the chat at the end of the first session, have students move, but it's really kind of awkward. It's best just to get in touch with CTS, get one of their business licenses, they'll get you set up as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. and then you, you'll be all set to go and not have this 40-minute uh, limitation. Um, you would then log in. I, there's a couple ways of doing this. I tend to log into my account at zoom.us and use the web interface for scheduling all of my meetings and so forth. So once you get account information from CTS, you can go to zoom.us, log in, and you'll see your dashboard. And uh, you'll have a part of your dashboard where it lists all of your meetings. Uh, there is schedule a new meeting option here or, or up here. Uh, there's lots, you know, it, it makes it easy for you to see what button to click on to schedule a new meeting. 
when you do that, um, you know, it's like adding an activity to Moodle. You've, you, what are you going to call it? When is it going to take place? How long is it going to take place? Um, let me see what some of these. Um, you know, do you want um, the uh, a meeting to have a password? I tend to uh, remove that because it's just one more barrier to having students get in. Um, the default is not to have every, everyone's uh, webcam on automatically. You can just leave that there. If you want students to talk later during the session, they can, they can go down to the bottom of the Zoom screen and turn on their webcam. Uh, do select both audio modes because some students might have trouble with computer audio. And so even though they are launching the Zoom session on their laptop or their desktop uh, or wherever, they might still want to call in on their phone to do the back and forth uh, audio part of it. You can enable your students to join before you get there. That's how I had this set, uh, session set up, so that by the time I got here, there were already, you know, three dozen of you in the room having a great time talking uh, and so forth. If you don't want that, if you want, if you want to be in the room before your students are in, you can enable a waiting room. And so when they go to, um, to access the link, so just like you had a link to click on to get to this session, you will eventually get a link for the session you're setting up, and you'll give that out to your students, as we'll see in the next slide. They can click on that link. If you've got a waiting room set up, they'll get a message from Zoom saying, the host isn't here yet. Hang out. Check your audio while you're here. And as soon as you uh, enter the room, they'll come in, and you'll all be there together. Uh, so if you do fill all this out, click Save, then, um, then that that meeting will show up as in your upcoming meetings. And they're all just kind of listed chronologically. As you can imagine, I've been scheduling a ton of Zoom meetings this last couple of weeks. Uh, if you click on the, the link for any given meeting, you'll see the information on that meeting. There you will see a URL that you can send out to your students so they can send. But if you click this copy the meeting invitation link, you'll get a more uh, a more detailed listing, which will not only have, well, here's the link that they need to, to click on to go to your Zoom meeting, but here's the meeting ID. If they are going to call in on the phone to do uh, uh, phone audio rather than computer audio, the, you'll, there will be phone numbers. These phone numbers don't charge the students anything. So you set up the session, you invite the students by giving them the link, um, you all come together and um, do the kinds of things we've been talking about. You either uh, you know, have everyone turn their, their webcam on and their microphone and you try to have a, try to mirror the kind of class discussions you would have, or you tell your students, uh, no, I want everyone to mute yourselves today because uh, at least for the beginning, because I want to spend the first 25, 30 minutes presenting some material, and we don't want a lot of, you know, noise background, uh, and I'm going to share my screen. You're going to see the slides I'm talking about. Uh, you'll be all, all set that way. So that's, that's one way of setting it up. Like I say, my preference is to log into my account at zoom.us, but if you... Um, launch the client on your computer, on your desktop computer, on your laptop, or if you launch the mobile app on your device, you can also handle scheduling from the Zoom app itself. Uh, it'll look a little bit different. I mean, here's what it looks like um, from the Zoom application on my MacBook. Here's what the Zoom app on my iPad looks like before I've signed in. But in either case, you, um, 
you have the ability to click on schedule a meeting. You'll get the same kind of meeting scheduler. It will be a little bit abbreviated from the web interface, but again, you know, what are you calling your session? When is it happening? What's the date? What's the time? How long is it lasting? Um, there are, there's a way to expand the advanced options down here at the bottom of this screen capture that I didn't bother including, where you can set up a, you know, join before enter or some of these other things. You know, no matter how you set them up, those meetings will show up in your list of meetings. And when it comes time, you either need to start the meeting if you're the first one in, or if you set up to allow the students to join before you, your meeting might actually be already in place, in play by the time you go to join it. Um, uh, Marie, let me stop here, ask if there are any questions from the chat that I should address at this point. I guess maybe not. Okay. So once you're in your Zoom session, um, you've, you've all been in this Zoom session, I just want to point out a couple of, of features by sh sharing some screenshots. Um, you know, you should all be familiar with the basic uh, Zoom interface by now. This particular screen capture, I've got the session in um, speaker mode. So I had the session going on on my laptop, as well as uh, my two different tablets and my phone, so I could have a little, uh, a little class session with myself. Uh, and this is what it looks like in speaker mode. Again, you, you might need to tell your students, you know, scroll over the Zoom screen, you'll see all of these tools down at the bottom. The, you know, make sure they know where they mute and unmute their microphone, where they start and stop their video, how they can open up the participants uh, panel and the chat window. Um, you would click on the little share tool at the bottom of the screen as I'll show some screen captures in a minute. Um, you know, participants are listed here. Chat is going on here. Um, one thing about the chat window, when, if someone enters late, they will only see new chat. The, a late entry won't necessarily see all of the pre-existing chat. So if you've put together, if you've put in a link to a Google Doc that you want everyone go, to go to at the beginning of your session, and you do have people coming in later, you might want to chat that link another time after additional students have come in so that they've got the link as well. Uh, if you need to, you can, um, because you're host and owner of the session, you can click on this button to mute everyone's microphone. Uh, and, um, you know, if you've got some problems with feedback that, you know, you, students don't know that they need to turn their, their, mic, their mic off, you can, you can handle that. Nina, I saw you raised your hand. Maybe not. Um, there, you can do polling in your Zoom sessions. Um, you have, you probably would need to set that up. Uh, again, we don't have time to go into that today, but I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in more detail in the workshop. Um, Sebastian, what's up? Uh, this is the gallery view, or what I like to say, the Brady Bunch view. Sorry, I, I can't see the screen that you seem to be sharing. I see you instead. I don't know if because I clicked on you before. Or uh, so how do you how do you go to see other what, whatever you're sharing other than yourself? Um, good question. Uh, if you clicked on my thumbnail and made that, basically, if you clicked on my thumbnail, you probably made that. Uh, the focus of your Zoom session. You probably need to look through the thumbnails and find the actual screen share and click on that. Okay, I got uh, it. Actually, the, it, it should just be the, the lone tile on the top. 
Okay. Double click. I, I saw yeah. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in, m I think many of us will probably want to share materials with our students. Um, so again, if you click on that share tool, you will get a, um, a, a box from, from Zoom asking you what you want to share. If you've got multiple windows open like I do all the time, you can choose which window you want to uh, share. So I could have selected this one or I could have selected this one. The only thing you have to be careful about though is if you share a specific active window, that's the only thing that Zoom is going to provide to the other participants. If you are sharing that window and you switch over to some application, like you were in PowerPoint and you want to bring up a Word document, Zoom is not going to share that Word document. So what I normally do is select the option to share the whole, my whole desktop. It doesn't, it's not as bad as it sounds because I usually have so many windows open, nobody sees my desktop. Basically, this option shows, uh, allows you to, whatever is, is taking the focus of your desktop, that's what's, that's what's shared. So especially if you want to share a session where you are moving back and forth between some different applications, go ahead and share the desktop and that way you can, you can go into Word and then you can go over to Excel and then you can go back to your Google Doc slide and so forth. Um, there is a whiteboard tool, so maybe you just want to pop up a whiteboard and draw on the tool. Now, I hate drawing with a computer mouse, but if I were doing this on my iPad where I've got my Apple Pencil, I could open up a whiteboard and share that and then just, you know, draw on the whiteboard to my heart's content to, uh, to share. Um, and then once you do share, um, you get this kind of a view, okay? So this probably looks a lot messier than what you all are seeing in your Zoom sessions. The thing, a couple of things you have to kind of juggle when you are sharing your desktop or a particular active window. Um, you can see that uh, all of the thumbnails become this kind of floating palette. The tools that used to be down at the bottom are now in this kind of floating toolbar at the top. And oftentimes those will um, self-hide so that they're not in the way. The floating palette of thumbnails doesn't, but you can drag that around to different parts of the screen so that you can interact with the parts of the screen you want to focus on when you are sharing. These floating palette windows do not get pumped out to your student's view. So your students might see you trying to you know, move your cursor up somewhere to do something, and they might ha not have any reason, any understanding why. It's because you're trying to interact with some tool that is uh, being displayed to you, like you want to start um, a poll up, and they might know, not understand why your cursor is going to the top, top of the screen because they're not going to see the same toolbar. Um, okay, so, I mean... That's, I, I've tried to pull out for today the main nuts and bolts of using Zoom that will get everyone started who hasn't used it before. You know, get your account from CTS if you haven't uh, gotten one yet. Um, oh, and, and Bill, I, I, I blew right past dis discussing the Zoom licensing. Do you want to talk a little bit about the process of, of getting those uh, Zoom licenses from CTS? Bill or Doreen or somebody? I'm sorry, I can't hear a thing. Can't yeah. Hear yeah, so what, what Bill said was just reinforcing what we had talked about before, either uh, you know, submit a work order because the, that if you can, because that's their preferred way of getting requests. But you can just email helpdesk at purchase.edu with the request. I, I need a Zoom Pro license. They're, they actually they actually got Zoom business licenses, which are uh, one step up from Zoom Pro. 
Um, and you can email that to the help desk. They'll convert that into a, a ticket in the work order system, and they will get you the information out. You know, here's your username. Here's your account. Again, my, my recommendation would be to log in at zoom.us and manage your account there, create your sessions, start your sessions, and invite your students, you know, get the, get the link and use either a, an announcement in Moodle or use the distribution list in my heliotrope, either one of those ways to tell your students, we're meeting at this Zoom address, click on it, open up Zoom in your, in your tablet, on your phone, on your laptop, and this is where we're going to meet for class. Um, my mic better now? Much better, Bill. Thanks. Right. I was using the wrong mic. Okay. So um, I don't have a lot more, but I, I would just make, uh, and we've I've kind of alluded to some of these things. Managing a class in Zoom online is going to be different than managing your face-to-face -face class. So um, you're even with everyone's webcam on, you're not going to be able to manage the nonverbal cues as effectively. Uh, some other class management issues um, you might want to think about. Encourage your students to sign in to the Zoom session with their full name. You know, Marvin Martian 681 is not going to help you very much if that's how they sign in. Um, how do you how can you take attendance well if they have signed in with their full name you can look at the participants list and see who's there and who's not but I, I might suggest you ha you have them do what I had you do have them open up the chat uh, and and, um, and, and type in their full name and hit return because you can archive the chat that's a much easier way for you to get a, a permanent record of of who was there because in the heat of in the throes of putting on a zoom classroom you may not remember to look at the participants list to, to check off who's there and who's not but if they've all have taken the two seconds to type their name into the chat you can download and save the chat later and you can at your leisure say oh yeah Susan was here Frank was here Deborah was here and so forth uh, one question you want to think about as an instructor is whether you want to use the mute, mute all function or not. If you are kind of in presenter mode for that particular session, I'd recommend that you, you, know, you hit mute all and say, you know, use the hand raising function or type into the chat that you want to speak if, you, if, if you've got uh, something you need to ask or just use the chat function itself. Um, in terms of trying to manage a conversation, uh, you can do the, the Brady Bunch display view of, of uh, thumbnail screens up to 49 students, but trying to actually manage a conversation the way we would do a class discussion face-to-face -to -face in that kind of situation is going to be very awkward. You will have to think about, okay, I do want to take the next 20 minutes to have a class discussion on this topic. So uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing because the more screen sharing you're doing, the more people are going to be inhibited from uh, entering the conversation. Maybe you ask everyone to turn on their webcams and switch to the Brady Bunch view. You're going to have to figure out how to call on people because the last thing you want is 25 people trying to get on the mic at, the, at one time. And again, if you're not talking right now, if, if everyone could mute their mics, that would help. Um, you can use breakout rooms. You can use polling, uh, some of these other ways to engage students, and we'll go into those in more detail uh, later. But I guess... Yeah, I mean, raising function. I don't see it on here. Um, it's it, if you're in it as a participant, you should see it somewhere in the in the participants window. But uh, I can't actually pull it up you know, with what I'm doing right now. Um, I I guess I mean hopefully those of you who haven't used Zoom before are at least oriented enough to begin starting to use it. I hope everyone is, is, 
you know, thinking that, well, Zoom is, is available for us as a tool, but I don't necessarily have to feel compelled to run everything as a Zoom session to replace my face-to-face -face classes. Again, the idea is we're not replacing class time. We're replacing experiences. Use Zoom, use Moodle, use the tools in Moodle um, to provide your students the opportunities to do what they need to do to successfully complete your courses. Uh, so we've already gone over, which is fine. Uh, Adam, I see you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I just have like a bit more of a pressing concern in that I was going to give a written midterm to my theory class. How is yeah. that going to work as far as I don't see if a way to administer no, a written no, that, exam? No, that's not a Zoom thing. Uh, let me give you an update on that. Okay. On Tuesday, yesterday, I submitted paperwork to Respondus to quickly as quickly as we can bring on board two products. One is their lockdown browser, and one is their AI monitor function. Uh, as soon as they can get that paperwork processed, we can begin a free trial of these two tools, which will allow us to create those learning assessments you're talking about, Adam, as, um, as assessments in Moodle that the students can launch from your Moodle course, but once they do, they launch it into a specialized browser that doesn't allow them to do anything other than take the exam. So hopefully, I don't know for certain that I'll be able to have that online by the end of the week, but I hope to at least have a time frame that I can share with with Barry and the others that we should be able to have these tools online by X amount of time so that when Barry comes out with his messaging at 6 p.m. on Friday saying here's how we're going to proceed going forward we will at least know how we can handle those high stakes online exam situations now okay. Moodle Moodle does have a perfectly functional quiz activity I use it a lot I use it mostly for low stakes assessments though, and I don't typically use it a, a lot for a high stakes, like end of the semester exam kind of situation. I know some faculty do, but um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, just as it pertains to my particular exam, we're talking about writing music on a music staff, so I, I don't know a way I can do that on Moodle. They can't enter music on a music staff in that software. Um, what so I mean, do they do that in Sibelius or some other no. software? I mean, in class, I print the exam and I write it okay. on a piece of paper because that's the easiest way to do it. So, um, you can't ask them all to have the same uh, music notation software. Right. You could, you could convert it. I mean, this might not be um, an ideal situation, but you could convert that into a uh, a a Moodle assignment where you are provide you're ask, asking them to write out the the music notation that you want them to write out, scan it in, and, and upload it to Moodle as an assignment. But you can do some things like, uh, okay, I'm only giving everyone this one hour window to do this assignment. I mean, there are things you can do to okay. um, t to tweak how you handle that, but that might be one way. That could uh, work. I, thank you. There is actually, in Moodle, we have added to the quiz activity a whole variety of music annotation question types. So you could actually set up a Moodle quiz activity where uh, you are asking them to uh, identify notes or to, um, you know, uh, and I haven't played with this a lot. It's been in Moodle for a couple of years. Uh, where you actually have them do music notation activities as part of the quiz questions in Moodle. So maybe, maybe Adam, if that's it, of, uh, of interest to you all, shoot me an email and we can go over that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So um, I guess uh, what's the British model? Uh, don't panic and keep onward or something. Um, uh, hopefully we can all... Be flexible, 
Uh, hopefully, Marie and I and the TLTC can provide you all support, although, of course, we're, we're getting slammed pretty hard as well. Uh, but we'll provide as much support as we can. Uh, work with CTS to get the Zoom licenses if you want to do synchronous online classes. Um, if you've got questions about pedagogical uses of, of activities in Moodle that might support what you want to do with your classes, you know, send those to TLTC at purchase.edu. Marie and I will get back to you on that and hopefully we can successfully get our students to the end of the semester. I think I'll stop sharing my screen, um, but uh, I'm, I've got to get to a SUNY web call at three o'clock on the SUNY-wide COVID response, so maybe the governor response will be part of that. But you know, if people have other questions, um, I don't have anywhere to go for the next 15 minutes. Thanks, Keith. I'm going to sign off, but I just want to say thank you for doing all this. Yep. Well, it's been, I, again, it, it, we're not doing online learning. We're, how can we do remote instruction to help our students? And, and hopefully we can go forward that way. All right. Well, stay sane. You too. Take care. Bye. Keith. Thank you. Bye. Oh, I had a question. Yeah. I see, uh, there's other people that have hands up before me, apparently. Oh, now that oh, I'm not Adam sure. And Olga. Yeah, now that I'm not sharing my screen, I see a whole bunch of hands up. So, uh, Paul is at the top of my list, yeah. Paul Siegel. Hi. Um, how do we copy the invitation, like, into an email to the class? So, if you've set up your session in Zoom and you, see, you click on the, uh, to look at the information for that session, Mm -hmm. There'll be a little link that says copy invitation. Yeah. That pops up in another little window. There should be a window that says actually copy it. It'll, it, it will select everything and automatically put it on the, on the clipboard for you. You can just. Oh, and then I, no, I saw that. And so then from that clipboard, you just copy that whole thing into an email. Copy that whole thing into an email. Copy that whole thing into a Moodle announcement. If you do it in a, in a Moodle announcement, it will get emailed out to the students, but it will also still be in Moodle as an announcement. So right. students can always come back to it. Use the distribution list in uh, my heliotrope. You know, all students really need is that join URL if they're going to totally be using the computer or their, their laptop or tablet. Um, but if you give them the whole, if you give them at least the part of the, uh, the invitation that has the connect URL, the meeting ID, and the call-in numbers, mm -hmm. then they can join the Zoom session whichever way makes sense for them. Got okay. it. Thank you. Okay. Yep. So, um, Adam, uh, do you still have, need your hand up, or did I cover your questions? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Uh, Olga. Sebastian? Hi. Oh, so one thing that I noticed uh, about uh, managing uh, the turns to speak is that when you raise your hand in the participants, they go to the top of yes. the list. So that helps you see who had them in order. I guess you're doing that now, but just, I guess, for everybody, because I was wondering about yeah. how to manage the, the order. And yeah. uh, you know, uh, the, what, what I was going to say is about, about the, um, if I understand correctly, this, this uh, option that you mentioned about a specialized browser that doesn't allow anything other than the exam, that's to prevent cheating for like the students not to use like Google or something. Right. Uh, I particularly don't think that that's going to help much because they always have their phones or something yeah. else. So but, I would rather like just design the exam so that it's meant that they can right. use notes or something, but yeah. they're not going to be able to find the answers on the internet. Yeah, and I totally, I totally agree with that, Sebastian. The more we can do authentic assessments rather than, I mean, the last thing I want to do for an online high stakes exam for my freshman Mars class where the students aren't invested is to do a multiple choice question uh, exam where they're, you know, doing that kind of search. So, yeah, authentic uh, assessments are, 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 are great. Um, there are some faculty where this might be useful. The, there, there is some, I mean, the lockdown browser is one part. We're also, I'm also getting a trial on their monitor, which would mean, 
Um, I mean, there are certain behaviors beyond the browser that uh, happen like, you know, hey Siri, what's the question, you know, it, it, they, they, they can, there can be that kind of monitoring, but, but yeah, I totally agree that the more we, as we switch to this remote instruction format, the more we can focus on authentic assessments that get around some, or, or an exam where you know that they are, have the ability to look things up, but you're, you're testing or you're exploring how well they can actually manipulate and analyze and evaluate that information. Yeah, I was I was gonna add that. Um, I, I guess I, I've done some exams uh, like that and or quizzes. And in addition to that, um, is to limit the time so that they don't have that much time yep. to be looking for th things up. So tell them that they have to study ahead and not count on having a yep. lot of time to look for those things, even though they might have their yep. notes, but they're not gonna have the time to go right. through their notes for everything. And when, then to um, you can see if, what. If you, if, if you let them take it at any time, uh, like for that limited time, but within a couple of days window or something like that, that also allows you to see like if people take it together and if you have suspicions of people getting similar answers or, or around the same time, you can see like the exact, like the order in which they go through the questions and things like that, that sometimes does reveal like, oh, the, the students like all answer the questions together and then they yeah. find, because if you yep. randomize the order, they should give it a different order, but then they start answering in the same order. That is a problem. Um, yep. but so just, I guess, to warn them that this has to be individual work, and then you can just check some things if people yep. get similar answers. Even when I do the low stakes quizzing in Moodle, I will, uh, I will say do a Moodle quiz that I want them to uh, do to make sure, so that I know that they're engaging with the reading for the week. I might have a 30 question question bank that I put up into Moodle and every time a student takes the quiz they get a different set of 10 questions from that bank so they're getting each each time and I, I for the low stakes I let the students actually do it multiple times because the more time they're spending with the material for those low stakes assessments the better so yeah all of these pedagogical things should really inform how we're uh, approaching the technology tools that are available. Um, got a few more minutes. Uh, Ellen, are you still online? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So my question is about using the written chat part of this. And can I um, put a have students look at a photograph at an image from the PowerPoint by sharing my desktop and not have them talk but in Zoom, but just share the written chat part? Yeah. Okay. And then w the transcript gets, I can download. And send yeah. Uh, there is, um, what I normally do is before I close and exit the session, I will just uh, select one of the words in the chat in the scrolling chat and then hit uh, command all on my Mac and just copy the whole chat and you know copy it into wherever I want to save it to okay and so if I if I want to only have the written conversation I just ask everyone to mute everything and I just yeah. keep mine unmuted in case directly yeah. okay so my other question is there's a, a written chat in our Moodle site but it wouldn't be synchronous, or am I incorrect about that? Um, there, there, is, there is a chat activity in Moodle, and it will allow you to do live text-based chat, okay. which can be useful for office hours, for example. Maybe you don't want to do a full-fledged Zoom session for your office hours, but you can tell your students, I'm going to go into Moodle, I'm going to set up this chat activity, I'm going to have it popped open uh, during office hours. If you want to come in, you can text me, yeah, so yeah, Marie's just uh, list, uh, added a link into the chat for, uh, into the Zoom chat for the, the Moodle chat. Okay, all right, and so if I, going back to the Zoom chat again, I would just create a, sh a shared screen to show my PowerPoint. Correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. you can do that, okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, quick question. Uh, 
so I had a question about, um, is there a big difference or recommendation to either set up a specific meeting? And I didn't realize you could do a recurring meeting versus just sharing my account info. Because I'm the only one using the account and only for teaching. So I just put the Zoom link at the top of the Moodle page instead of like. Yeah, I mean, every, every Zoom account will come with your own personal meeting room. And if you just want to use that for all of your classes, you can give everyone the same meeting information and then, um, uh, you know, when it's time for class X, you go into your personal meeting room and hopefully and presumably only the students from class X will join you there. Right. Um, I think it's a little bit easier because I'm dealing with like a very specific cohort of grad students. So maybe that would yeah. be for everybody, but I just wanted to make sure there's nothing like wrong with me choosing to do that in this situation. Nope. Nope. Okay. That'd be fine. And then one other question. Um, you said you're going to be talking about breakout rooms in the session tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you'll be recording that, right? Because I don't think I'm going to be able to. Make uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. My, my plan going forward for all of our, our TLTC workshops, not just this, emergency let's get everybody remote instructoring uh, but for all of our workshops going forward I, I i like the idea of having the remote uh, option through zoom we've gotten more faculty participation that way and that allows me to uh, record all of them okay great thank you so much keith yep uh, author uh hi keith can you hear me yep um thanks so I just want to know uh, a couple questions about the recording feature. Is it possible to chop up the recording into smaller pieces, like instead of a one? Yeah. Well, pieces? Zoom will Zoom will give you uh, an MP4 file. So whatever video editing tools you have available to you, you can certainly. Um, yep. Okay. Um, my other question was just um, uh, for in terms of like the the cloud recording so having it save on zoom itself how big yeah you will run out of cloud recording space very quickly which is why i always do the recordings down to my computer i've got hard drive space and then um i quickly get the uh, recordings up into my up into either my personal youtube account or to our tltc youtube account and then uh, then it's there and I don't have to keep it on my hard drive. Just creating some sort of YouTube account for, for these. Things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Benjamin again. Hi. Yes. I had a question about uh, the chat function because it seems the Moodle chat is kind of all or nothing that students can see what other students are typing. Right. I'm interested in holding office hours where they can just talk to me. Is Zoom chat, if they, if they send it to me in Zoom chat, I see there's a kind of like two function in the chat. Would that right. go to yes. me with others, without others seeing it? Yeah, you can do, uh, you can do uh, private pairwise chatting uh, in, in Zoom if you select the appropriate uh, um, person you're sending the chat to. Okay. Great. The default on the Zoom chat is to everyone. Mm -hmm. So you would have to select it. And, and then that sticks. So I've been in, in Zoom sessions where I've private chatted something and then I went to uh, make a comment for the whole room. And of course, it just went to the one person I was private chatting to. Okay. So if I'll, I'll instruct students then in kind of during my office hours just to chat at me and then they don't have to worry about right. it. Right. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Sebastian. Okay. Well, I, I need to pop out and go over to this uh, SUNY web call on the COVID response. So uh, I, thank you all for, for showing up today. Um, and for those who you who have uh, stayed on to the bitter end, uh, all 74, 73 of you. Uh, if you have any questions on pedagogy, uh, send those our way. Uh, if you need uh, a Zoom account, work with CTS, and uh, we'll get you all set to go with your classes. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Keith. Stop, because she can't get it ready in time for tomorrow. Wait, just one second. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Yep. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Okay.